Hey everyone, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, October 18th, 2013. We have got so many stories for you today uh, that it's going to just feel like we're moving at light speed. We're going to be talking about uh, SpaceX's reusable plans, vertical takeoff and landing planes, Comet Ison still together after all these years, a more than a thousand exoplanets, rogue planets, the government shutdown, lunar eclipse, solar eclipse. Uh, it's Mars clouds, tilted planets, it just goes on and on. Uh, so joining me this week is our regular cast and crew. Um, so I'm going to start with Alan Boyle from NBC. Live yeah. long and prosper. <laughs> and uh, joining us again is Brian Wang from Next Big Future. And last time we had Brian here, uh, his uh, technology was sort of failing him. This time it has been rock solid. This is going to work. Glad to have you join us, Brian. Uh, David Dickinson, who is at the hey, Necronomicon. Here, right here at the 2013 Necronomicon here in Tampa. Yeah, just the start of it. I'm going to be doing Star Party duty and a few panels tomorrow, too. Talking about exoplanets, as a matter of fact. Again. Will you be summoning one of the great old ones by the end of this con? <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> Elizabeth Howell. Elizabeth. Hey, how's it going? Good. And so we've got a special guest, which is like my dream to bring on special guests every week. And so I'm finally getting organized enough to make this happen. And so this week, we've got John Zeller, the founder of Space Advocates, and he is best known for the Penny for NASA campaign. Hey, John. How's it going? Hey, thanks for having me. And I think it's a really good timing to have you here on the Weekly Space Hangout because the government shutdown just ended and 97% uh, of Thank NASA God. employees were, <laughs> were sent home during this. And, uh, you know, this is just the end of a long line of, of funding problems. So, so can you give us sort of some background on what, the, uh, on what, your, what your group is? So Space Advocates is the nonprofit organization that runs the Penny for NASA campaign. Penny for NASA is the thing, as you said, that we are most, most known for. Um, most notably. Uh, so we started Penny for NASA in March of 2012. Uh, you might remember uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson going up in front of the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation speaking about the future of the nation's space program. And in that speech, he kind of offhandedly said, what if we were bold? What if we doubled NASA's budget to one penny on the taxpayer dollar? Because currently, it's 0.48%, or just under half a penny. And the internets ran with it. Uh, we ended up jumping on the same bandwagon, and we formed an organization around it and kept the steam going. To date, we've sent over 10,000 letters to members of Congress um, that are all custom writ letters. They aren't templated letters. These are letters that our supporters have sent to their members of Congress that we can verify actually made it there um, in support of increasing NASA's funding to 1%, um, which, speaking monetarily would raise it from about 17.7 .7 to just under 39 billion a year. Um, and that would really expand what NASA is already doing and, and, and allow them to do it quicker um, and with more fervor. And how has uh, the government responded? Um, as you can expect, we are in a uh, kind of a fiscal crunch. And uh, there's lots of arguments that I've been hearing about happening in, uh, in Congress that have, have stopped us from being able to do things like fund the government. Um, but so it's, it's slow to catch on. We are gaining steam um, as far as public support goes, but it's going to be a long fight. Um, there's a lot of little battles along the way as well. So, I mean, what is the, I mean, you're doing a letter writing campaign, mm -hmm. and, you know, what other kinds of activities are you guys doing that will sort of help bring in that? convince people that this is an important thing. So currently we've been doing a lot of public outreach. We have, we're available on every form of social media that, that is really relevant um, at this stage in the game. We have almost 20,000 followers on Facebook and we're up over 50,000 one-ups on uh, Google+. Plus. Um, and we really try and stay active with our supporter base and our supporter base stays active with us. We have um, a really high amount of interactivity when it comes to the posts and things that we make. So we try to keep people aware of the things that are happening in the space realm, um, not to just do with NASA, but also with commercial space as well. Um, and just keeping people aware that this is relevant, this is necessary, um, and then also at the end of the day, you need to actually contact your members of Congress to make this happen. As we go forward, we're going to be looking to try and do stuff um, more proactively from inside the organization and actually get some of our members, um, some of our volunteers rather, 
to be working exclusively um, trying to find ways to actually contact members of Congress and influence actual legislation. Um, but we've needed to grow to get to that point, and we're, we're getting there. But uh, it's, it's a long road ahead, and none of us are experts. <laughs> what do you think would happen if NASA actually did get that extra penny? You, you know, know, that's a... If, if it went up to the $37 billion. Right. It's a really good question. Um, from what I understand, a lot of, a lot of scientists and, and the administration as well within NASA will tell you that things won't change. Um, and that's great. We love what they're doing. We just want to see more of it. Um, I would expect that we would see a Mars plan on the table a lot sooner um, because suddenly we actually have the money to start thinking of things like that. But we'd also see an expansion of things like the robotic spaceflight program, the planetary science program. We'd see ex expansion all over the board. Um, and that's exactly what we're looking for. We don't want NASA to necessarily change what they're doing. We just want them to do more of it. You, you mean like a manned Mars plan is what you're talking about? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Or even intensifying the robotic plan. I mean, we need to do a sample return mission. That is the logical step to go after we have, have dropped Curiosity on the planet. And there's not a whole lot more that we can do beyond a sample return mission that doesn't require an actual person uh, being there to actually make the discovery. Yeah, sa sample return always seems like something that's 20 years away. <laughs> it, it really does. It really does. Yeah, <laughs> you could you could have a parlor game over what you would do with that extra money because uh, people talk about Europa or uh, yeah. orbiter and seeing Enceladus, uh, upping the ante for uh, looking for ex extra solar planets and atmospheres. So uh, I think there are lots of ways we could discuss to spend that money. Terrestrial so, uh, planet that, finder. That would take care of the whole hour. Okay, this is just killing me. And we I would be. Yeah. Kind of yeah. like, I wish I, I wish I had never asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just so many great missions that you hear about that never get that never get done. Well, and it's, well, could you look at them um, doing something different in terms of um, having more of like what you had with the um, training the highways, national highway system before, to look at having this new doubled up NASA have half of it go towards making space a lot cheaper. So right. we're we're heading that direction with reusable rockets, maybe with Elon, but um, then if you were to have uh, fuel depots, building things to make right. things cheaper, then everything else gets enabled. So then you get a, more multiples. I think a really, really good position for NASA going forward is to to start to hand off the torch for the remedial stuff that they've figured out and they have more or less solid. I don't mean to call flying around the planet at 17,500 miles per hour re like remedial, but they've, they've made an art of it um, and they've figured out how to do it and it's time that those processes get passed down to the commercial side so that NASA can actually focus on what they do best, which is pushing the frontier. That's even stuff that we can do that's possible to begin with. And they are the best at doing that. Well, that kind of leads into my next question, which is a bit more of devil's advocate, which is that, you know, I think NASA has accomplished a lot of really amazing things. And at the same time, though, we're starting to see some of these developments by SpaceX and, mm. you know, some of these other more private aerospace firms, and they've been taking leaps and jumps ahead decreasing costs, and and so, you know, is putting all of that additional revenue into the government, into a government-led program, the best way to accomplish these goals, or is there a better partnership that could be made, maybe, you know, spread that money around a little a little wider? I'm certain, I'm certainly not claiming that the policy that, that exists is perfect. Um, it certainly, it certainly could change quite a bit, um, to name a few, putting NASA on a multi-year budget. Um, but I would say public and private space have their strongest qualities to themselves. Um, public space really needs to be focused on pushing the envelope of what's possible. We aren't going to see a business go to Mars and colonize for the first time. That will be a government funded effort regardless of if the technology is purchased from a private contractor. And the stuff that's more I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for, but th that's happening day to day and that is, is a continuous part of the background operation, like getting us into lower Earth orbit, should be the purview of, of private industry. And that should be the stuff that we start to pass off. Because naturally, government isn't a business. Government isn't looking to churn a profit and government isn't necessarily yes, interested in having a positive cash flow. And that's not a fault of the government. That's just how that works. You, you, you use up your money, you get the money the next year. Business does a better job because it is naturally a part of their existence in this larger ecosystem. So it makes sense to give those things that we've already figured out off to the private industry so that NASA can actually use that money not managing the stuff that 
really could be done better by private industry and actually spending that money figuring out the stuff that no one has ever done before. So how do people get involved? Go to pennyfornasa.org. We have a lot of ways for you to get involved. First and foremost, we're asking people to write a letter to your congresspersons. We have a really easy to use widget on the website. Go to pennyfornasa.org, click on Take Action, put in your name, your number, write a short letter to your congressperson, and we will send it automatically to all um, of your representatives and your senators. Terrific. Okay. Also, like us uh, on Facebook and Google+. Plus. <laughs> and the last thing is, you know, as I said, you're best known for Penny for NASA, but now you've you've got this larger umbrella organization, which is Space right. Advocates. So what kinds of activities is Space Advocates going to be doing? So currently, Space Advocates is just running Penny for NASA, though we did just launch spaceadvocates.com, and that's going to become kind of our, our central mission hub. And that's also going to be the place where you can find all of our space news. Um, that's going to be the main center for our blog coming up. Um, and as you said, the things that we're going to be doing that are coming up, um, there's a bunch of things in the works. Uh, we have a few ideas for user-generated content campaigns. Um, I don't want to give too many details up about out of that just yet, but uh, it's going to be pretty exciting. And we're looking at doing um, potentially some some video shows every week um, about a couple of different things. So awesome. we, have, we have some uh, some stuff coming up. Very cool. Okay, so very cool. so we should get into the into the news now. So John, thank you very much for giving us the the info, and thanks for agreeing to be one of my guest guinea pigs here. Absolutely. On, on the space <laughs> hangout. Now we're gonna start talking about some of the news. You can stick around if you want, or if Absolutely. you've got some stuff you got to work on, then then that's fine. I'd love to stick um, around. Cool. Okay, so let's. I want to talk about the government shutdown because that's sort of the big thing that that finally broke this week. And Elizabeth, I know you've been staying on top of this. What's going on? Well, uh, they're back, which is a good thing. Now, the thing is you can't just switch it on. It's not something that's just as simple as saying, okay, we're all back, we're all going to start our work now, because a lot of things were interrupted by the shutdown. For example, there were several astronomers that lost their time at telescopes because they were hoping to do it during the shutdown when they thought there wasn't going to be a shutdown. And uh, then they just lost their time when it happened. Other people had experiments that were running, and uh, they had to be stopped. In some cases, they have to be restarted because there are certain materials, um, animals, and other things that uh, just couldn't be uh, kind of put together really easily again. And uh, the other thing, too, is we're not really too sure about the fiscal impact of all of this. We know so far, uh, we've been seeing reports out there, that there have been about a $24 billion impact to the U.S. economy because of the shutdown, which is actually more than NASA's budget request I for guess 2014. I've seen that. Yeah, 17.7 billion. So the thing is, if we had this big impact to the economy, and there's also all this uncertainty about how long the stability is going to last. We're looking at about another three months. It's January 15th, I think it is, when they're going to have another deadline, and then uh, the debt's going to be uh, looked again at the fe February 7th. So we're just looking at a long period of instability, and I'm sure that a lot of people in the space community are wondering, okay, NASA's in the middle of these fiscal 2014 budget negotiations. Already we've got this $24 billion spent on the last shutdown. Could it happen again? What's going to happen again? But so uh, there's just a lot of questions about what's going to happen next, I think, at this point. Yeah, I mean, this but is really less... Let Maven get off the launch pad. ...and more... <laughs> kicking this can a little down the road, not coming up with a nice, decisive response to it. So, I mean, are we going to see this again in the spring? That's the question. I mean, um, that's something you have to go and ask your congressperson, I suppose. I'm a Canadian, so i got to be careful what I say here. But, uh, yeah, you know, a yeah, exactly. So uh, you you got to just go and uh, and follow the news and see what's happening and, and get involved however you can. Now, there has been some good news um, out of the shutdown situation. And I think the big one was MAVEN. Um, that's a Mars mission that's supposed to be lifting off around November 18th. And initially, it looked like it wasn't going to get off the ground because of the shutdown activities. It was interfering with the launch processing. But then they managed to get an emergency exception because this particular mission is going to be a communications relay for the rovers that are down on the surface, curiosity and opportunity. So uh, that was really good news, seeing that that was going to get started again. So we know that that's not going to be impacted by the shutdown, at least, although weather and other things can, of course, push the launch back a few weeks. And if they had delayed it, by the way, they would have had to wait until 2016. So that's a good thing that they managed mm -hmm. to get that uh, that launch going. Yeah, I mean, you get this, this these windows for launching to Mars, and if you don't make your window, then you got to wait. And, like, nature yeah, doesn't well, care about your... 24, 24, 26 months, usually, yeah. the window, so... Yeah, so, okay, well, so I guess we're just going to keep a, keep an eye on this and sort of see what happens over the next couple of uh, of weeks, months, and and years. So, cool. Um, <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to throw Brian on the hot seat here as, our, as sort of his first uh, space hangout, and Brian's brought a couple of stories... 
to our attention. And uh, so the first one is, is SpaceX is moving fast and furious on their plans for reusable spacecraft. And we've talked about the Grasshopper in the past, and this, I mean, this idea from from uh, Elon Musk that if you could make a spacecraft fully reusable, it drops the price of launches by a huge factor. So so where's he at with this? So the um, last launch um, that they had on September 29th <coughs> had um, <coughs> some some attempts to, to reuse the, the first stage. So was, they were trying to do a, um, a soft splashdown into the ocean, and they uh, this last week uh, released more details about that and show uh, the picture of that first stage reletting its engine um, just b before hitting the, the ocean and slowing down. So even though it hit harder than they wanted to and also was spinning because they didn't have um, the landing gear to stabilize it, they actually did a lot of the stuff which they had wanted to achieve in terms of um, getting that reusable. So I think the next two launches won't have reusability, but the third launch, they're actually going to try to land, I think, the, um, the first stage where they're going to um, put the landing gear on it and actually bring it back and, and land it. So, I mean, to put this into context, right, what is the sort of traditional way that, say, an Atlas or a Titan rocket is going to launch? All of its stages are destroyed and through the launch, and the if it's going to have any solid rocket boosters, they're gone, mm -hmm. and the whole thing is, is ruined. Right. So what parts of, of the spacecraft, then, is SpaceX looking to make reusable? <clears throat> they're looking to reuse um, all three stages. Uh, initially, they'll try and get the first stage to, to land and reuse that, and then there's talk that maybe it would be 25%, 50% cheaper because it's about 80% of the cost, and you'd reuse it, but you'd use some fuel in order to bring it back. But they can hopefully get 25% cheaper once using the first stage. But then they can reland both the, the next two stages. Then if it's only fuel costs, then you can bring the, the, the cost down 100 times. And... Um, they're using retro rockets because they had tried to use parachutes, but they didn't work. So they tried a few, a few other things which uh, did not work for me. So when, I mean, if he actually is able to piece this together with the with all of the different parts, when could he be launching fully reusable rockets? I mean, I think in our, in our perfect world, you've got this spacecraft that flies up, delivers some payload to orbit, returns to Earth, refuels like an airplane. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, he's sort of inching towards that. When do you think we might see like a fully reusable spacecraft? I think it, so. If he succeeds with this um, landing the, the first stage, then he could be use, reusing first stages after next year, um, and then it doesn't look like the the difference for the second stage is he would use I think this uh, Pika carbon material to to for the heat shield. So Pika heat shield and the same kind of landing system as you do in the first stage. I think it kind of all come together around 2018, 2022. It, it could kind of come together pretty quickly, I think. I know the last, Fal the last Falcon launch, they tried to do some of the maneuvers with the first stage uh, out of Vandenberg where they reversed the stage to try to, to have it thrust on reentry. I don't know how successful that test was. But. It didn't work because uh, they had a spin going on. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, during, when they tried to fire, they did two firings, and but yeah. uh, the spin kind of uh, caused centrifugal force that caused a flame out, and so it kind of smashed yeah. into the I, ocean. I know yeah, that, that was the landing gear thing. The, the that, landing gear helped stabilize it. I know that whole maneuver was part of the the whole uh, aiming toward reusability of that stage right. for the Falcon eventually. Yeah, well, and then and then the grasshopper, I guess, in that case, they're just testing, like, can you have a rocket take off and then just return right to the launch pad? So is that, like, a, another step down the road, or is that, like, would those act as, like, boosters attached to the, the stages? How would that all play together? It, the, the grasshopper work is basically what you would, your first stage would become, is that that would be the grasshopper you'd be using that. So it would be using the landing gear. So it's, it's uh, combining... Um, the work of trying to land this first stage at the high altitude, and then once you get down close, it, it's basically the grasshopper that you're doing. And the really uh, cool and neat thing that Elon Musk and SpaceX are doing is that that first stage was going to be destroyed anyway. So all they're doing is putting them up with $5 million or $10 million worth of gear onto it and then try to make it work. If it doesn't work, well, it would have burned up anyway and spent $10 million on it. So they're actually you know, on the cheap making it happen.
because it would have been destroyed. And I mean, the videos and images of, of this thing taking off are so impressive. I mean, if you've seen, there's a great video of the hexacopter that's, that was flying above and watching. I'll try and dig up that video while we're I saw that on Universe Day, just, yeah. Just amazing. Uh, okay, well, let's move on. Um, so I want to talk to Alan hmm? about this uh, really cool, um, uh, these new planets that, were, that are tilted at a really severe axis. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, there are all sorts of... Uh, weird planets that uh, the Kepler uh, Space Telescope and other planet hunting probes have come up with over the years. Uh, this is just uh, a strange one that highlights Kepler's ability to, um, to look for transits of planets across the Sun's disk and also uh, study the structure of a star uh, using a technique known as astroseismology. So they kind of look at the waves that are passing through the, the sun, the alien sun, and they can figure out what the orientation of that sun is going to be. And so they were surprised to find out that uh, they detected uh, a couple of planets, and uh, the sun that is associated with those planets uh, seem to be cockeyed. Actually, it's the, it's the planets themselves that are cockeyed, and uh, they're tipped uh, with in relation to their parent sun by 45 degrees. And so how could this happen? Uh, especially since you don't have a, a close-in Jupiter that appears to be uh, disturbing those orbits. And, and so what they did is that they, they took a wider look. They looked at some of the, some of the results uh, with a different technique for looking for planets called radio velocity. And they found an even bigger object uh, farther away from from the sun, and they think that this bigger object is helping to kind of stabilize the system. That somehow these planets got knocked into a 45 degree tilt, uh, but they're able to be stable in that tilt because of the gravitational influence of this wider object. Uh, and they hope that future observations will help them figure out whether this cockeyed tilt occurred during planet formation or after formation. But it just really goes to show what a strange menagerie uh, we're starting to build up of all these planets that are in weird orbits. Uh, earlier, the Hubble Space Telescope was used to, to uh, detect planets that were tipped 30 degrees with relation to each other. And so our own solar system, as weird as it is with all these dwarf planets hanging around around the edges and the asteroid belt, is really, it looks like uh, plain vanilla compared to what we're finding in these uh, other planetary systems. And we're getting close to having a thousand of these extrasolar planets being found. So it, it's really a revolution. It's too bad that Kepler went out of service, but we still have years of data to plow through to, to find alien Earths and, and all the other weird stuff that will help us get a better sense of uh, how planets are formed uh, in unusual circumstances like these tipped planets. Yeah, that's great. Uh, what is it? The universe is not only stranger than we understand. Imagine, but imagine. stranger than we can imagine. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, yeah. mm -hmm. that, I'm still that's able unusual. to imagine a tilted, a tilted uh, sun, though, so we're not quite there that's, yet. That is unusual, Alan, because in our solar system, our sun's only tilted seven degrees to our uh, the plane of the ecliptic, to the, the relative, the, the average plane of the planet. So everything's pretty stable here. Right, right. And then uh, it depends on what you count. Mercury is uh, seven degrees, and Pluto, my favorite planet, is uh, something like <laughs> 17 degrees. So yeah, yeah, um, they're not all precisely on the ecliptic, but they're pretty close within, except yeah. Pluto, within 10 degrees. Even the sun's sun's poles. And Elizabeth, I know you worked on this story too. I mean, was there any research that, like, like what would cause this? A, a collision with another star? Some kind of, I don't know, what would make it happen? I, I think that's an open question from my perspective, although maybe the, um, the paper had it buried in there somewhere. Uh, what I was going to say, though, was this really strikes me as one of those examples where we think that we have a certain set of rules or a certain set of situations for how planets behave, and then we go and we find another system that takes it all into turmoil because before we thought that it was only possible to have this kind of a tilt in an area that had hot Jupiters, which is those really massive gas giant planets that are almost right next to their star, which is why they're called hot Jupiters because there's so much heat going on. And so they thought, well, maybe the influence of these big gas giants were the ones that were making the planets all throw off their orbits and become tilted. But in this case, no, it's actually a planet that's much further away. 
And so now all the uh, orbital dynamicists or whoever does this type of stuff needs to go back and figure out again just exactly how these types of systems exist. So it goes to show you how much Kepler data still exists and how much more fun we're going to have as we look through it. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are literally thousands of exoplanets in that data. David, tell us yes. about the thousands of exoplanets that are in that data. Yes, we, we are, depending on which, uh, which database you look at, I usually look at the Extrasolar Planet Encyclopedia online daily. Uh, it's, we're right about 998 exoplanets right now. And that's within, let's see, just a little over 20 years because the first one was discovered back in 1992 was uh, actually it was a, a pair that was discovered around a pulsar. Uh, was discovered due to the, uh, the minute uh, glitches in the timing of the pulsar. Uh, and then the famous one that was discovered that really broke the floodgates was uh, Pegasi 51 in 1994. That was the first one around a main sequence normal type of star and they started discovering all the hot Jupiters. But uh, Kepler really opened up the floodgates, too. Uh, we're seeing a lot more. Most of them, if you look at the catalog, were discovered by a transits or radial velocity measurements. There's a handful that were discovered by gravitational lensing. Then you get these other odd, uh, like, exotic methods, like relativistic beaming and these other methods out there. But it's amazing because growing up as a kid, I remember in the 70s, that they were they gave the odds of finding an extrasolar planet within our lifetime about 50 percent. So here we live in an era where we know of by probably next week we'll know of a thousand. Uh, the way the catalog's been growing, and Kepler has a couple thousand left that haven't been confirmed yet, waiting in the pipeline still. And we've got more missions going up like Test and W First and a lot of these other missions out there that are. I wouldn't be surprised in the next decade we'll be reporting on 10,000 exoplanets. David, what's really incredible is that at one time, even just finding one planet was amazing, right? And now we've got a thousand of them, and it almost becomes just a little side part I, of the newspaper, right? <laughs> I, I remember getting the astronomy magazine in 1994 that had the big exclamation point, like planet discovered on the cover. That was back when we got our news from magazines. So it's, uh, yeah. yeah so they, I, it, and for years, uh, Bernard Star was one, like all through the 20th century, that was like hotly debated. I think it's ironic that as much as there was false alarms before in the 70s and 80s about Bernard Star having an exoplanet, it still doesn't have an exoplanet now that we're in an era where a thousand are known. Yeah, and I can, you know, I know that was, we were handing out stories on Universe Today, and we're like, oh, a new planet discovered. Eh, nothing special about this one. We'll skip it. You know? Yeah, it's like it's got to be fastest, hottest, hottest largest, yeah, diamond-crusted, uh, Tatooine-like. You know, we're almost creating categories to have new exoplanet stories on. So. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, exoplanets, but, you know, you got to really get it more interesting now. Um, okay, so, uh, so Brian, I want to talk to this other story that you put in front of our uh, eyes here, which is this... Uh, Vertical takeoff landing aircraft idea? What, what? <coughs> right. So um, <coughs> I, I covered the, the vision of um, pocket airports, which uh, is having a lot of airports inside a city, like, say, Manhattan. You'd have 80 of these airports. And the, the idea would be enabled by using vertical takeoff, vertical landing passenger aircraft, which actually um, the Europe. EADS is working towards that. They have um, um, a rocket, uh, a plane design that would that would um, might be able to achieve that. Also, Elon Musk has talked about supersonic, electric, um, vertical uh, vertical landing planes. So, once you have that, you don't need the big runway. So then you can just make it really small and just um, just have your airport terminal. So the image is, is of taking say the top 18 floors in the Empire State Building. And converting that into a, 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 a airport, where the vertical plane comes in, lands, and then people get on off. You <coughs> swap out batteries, something like that, and then then the plane off again. Uh, something else that came up today that makes this also more achievable is that Volvo has created body panels, um, sh um, batteries shaped in, as body panels for cars. So that could reduce the weight of a car, electric car, say by 15 percent. But it would have a big impact for electric planes if, if the batteries become part of the structure of, of, the, of the vehicle, make it more uh, light, more efficient. Which for planes is a huge deal, things lighter. Yeah, but I can just imagine the. I mean, you think about like the Helios, and there's a few like solar-powered planes, and things are, are battery-powered, and it's a lot of work, and you don't get a lot of power 
power out of a battery trying to push a plane. And, you know, to then make it a VTOL and actually land on top of a skyscraper, that seems pretty out there. Yes. That, that look like Stark look like Stark Towers in the picture there. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a complete reimagining of, of how to do it. Um, but, you know, like I said, Elon Musk, some of the smart people think they, they can do it. So, and then there are the products well, looking toward if it. Elon Musk says it can happen, then I'm, I'm all in. That's right. <laughs> but I guess, I guess the question then is, I mean, uh, you know, yeah, sure, you can build your, space, your, your airplanes out of batteries, uh, but you're still not going to get a long distance. You're not going to get these transatlantic flights. Are we talking about these little commuter hops? Like, you know, you're going to go from New Jersey to New York? Um, I think part of the vision might be having smaller planes that you would have um, 20 passenger planes that would go uh, between um, uh, closer airports and stuff that that might be part of it. Uh, the other, the full vision would be that you'd all have them supersonic. Like how you get that supersonic hypersonic aspect to it. The way I can imagine, well, for hy hypersonic would be that you can save on fuel by like skipping a stone over the top of the atmosphere kind of thing where you get get a lot of advantage that way. Um, but I haven't seen the full write-up of either a supersonic electronic plane, passenger plane, or, or the hypersonic one where I've seen any kind of closed engineering design. But uh, I've seen some aspects of it which suggested not completely insane, but um, that it would actually work. So hypersonic, electric-powered, Vertical takeoff and landing airplanes. That sounds That's perfect. Right. That sounds pretty feasible. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, the, I think that I mean the micro airports is a pretty great idea, and there's a lot of work on blimps as well. So you can kind of imagine these things being, you know, blimps are coming in, and and VTOLs are taking off, and it's just it's Blade Runner. I love it. Um, I, I think I don't think it's better for the United States. Like China has all the high speed rail stuff, but the U S. Like if you had like like let's say robotic cars take off. Uh, and, and become very popular. Then you have all this parking spaces that parking lots are not used anymore. So then you could convert those into airports, and that would, I think, match more with um, U.S. society how how we would want to get around. Cool, cool. Uh, all right. So what have we what do we want to talk about now? You know, I want to talk about a planet gone rogue, David. Oh yeah, there was an interesting uh, report that came out of a planet that was discovered by the Panstar Survey in Hawaii, uh, PSOJ318, it's got like a phone number like name, J318.5-22. And what's interesting about this planet is it is not tied down to a host star. It's about 80 light years away and it's about 6.5 times the mass of Jupiter. And this was discovered uh, due to the infrared uh, radiation that's giving off, because you always think, well, how can they see a rogue planet if it's not giving off any light, and it's not, there's no star to reflect light off it. This was actually during a survey for low-mass brown dwarfs that this turned up. And they knew they had something interesting because it was a very red object, and it was too low in mass. Brown dwarfs run out about 12 Jupiter masses, roughly 12 to 13, depending on, on, uh, on who you talk to, where uh, low-grade deuterium fusion starts, and then you're actually a star. Uh, so this one is just about half of that. And it's interesting that they actually managed, after watching this for two years and following it up with some other scope surveys, they found out that this is actually part of the Beta Pictoris moving group of stars. And that allowed them to pin down a little closer as far as what the age of it is. They think it's only about 12 million years old, which isn't very old at all. It's a very, it's a very young object. And unlike other exoplanets where they're swamped in the light of their, their host star, where we can't really see them, this one we can see without having that glare there, at least in infrared surveys it shows up. So it's it just an example of a lot of what's coming out of PanStars. PanStars generates like four, uh, I think it's four to ten terabytes of information a night. Uh, it's, it's generating a huge amount of data as it scans the sky. So it's interesting. We're probably going to see more low-mass objects like this. And something that always goes in the back of my brain, too, when I see these kind of discoveries is, you know, there, there's uh, nothing out there that says the jury is still out that there could be something like this much closer in within a few light years of even Alpha Centauri 
or our solar system. That would be kind of cool if they found. We're, we're not talking about yeah, Nibiru yeah. or anything like that. I've got to say, i, I got to put the disclaimer out there. We're not saying that Nibiru is out there. We're saying that it is It is possible. I've talked to some researchers before, and they said it is possible there could be some submass uh, objects that aren't related to our solar system just you know, within a few light years that just have... Uh, been, what's interesting, though, with these kind of infrared surveys and WISE and all these other things that they're going through the data, we, we should be able to... Uh, rule out whether there's anything uh, substellar mass within a few light years of our solar system pretty soon, within the decade. But I guess you can imagine the situation where you've got these solar nebulae where, you know, we see the stars forming because they're bright, but in yeah. smaller pockets of gas and dust, you can kind of imagine these things forming, and all you've and, got is a planet's worth, and then it just... And, and we've written on Universe Today, too, that these types of uh, rogue planets there's been some suggestions from uh, gravitational lensing surveys that they may be more common than planets that are associated with stars. They may be much more common out there. Again, they're tricky to find because they're so faint. The and this one, I think we're we're yeah, lucky. This was a very with them, yeah. this this one being only 12 million years old. It's still cooling off too, so it's it's still giving off a lot of infrared energy. Although it's not it's not dense enough to to perform fusion, so it's not and, shining by its own energy. And the, when these sorts of cases come up, there's there's usually a debate over whether they should be counted as planets or not. So there are some people who kind of take a hard line and say that, yeah. oh, in order for it to be a planet, it has to be formed around a parent star, and uh, if there's some other formation process, then you should call them planetary mass objects or planemos. Yeah. Uh, so it, it all goes back to how you define things, which is sort of a familiar <laughs> refrain. Alan, what's the, uh, the IAU definition of this? Like, Do they think that it would be a planet under those rules? They really, the IAU hasn't really uh, addressed yet how you yeah, define from, planets outside the solar system, and so uh, yeah, the 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 border from low from uh, high mass planet to low mass brown dwarf is still kind of a. I, I think we're going to have another discussion like we are on the lower end with Pluto. I think on the higher end of planetary mass, eventually that's there's going to be a discussion forced on when are you officially a star. Versus what I see online is usually between 12, 13, 14 Jupiter masses. Is, uh, but again, it's, it's kind of a great... We'll, we'll probably find objects that are going to blur that line. Yeah. There, sometimes there's not really a need to draw a line. It's yeah. just, you know, uh, that's, that's what happened to Pluto is that uh, a line got drawn and people... 6.5 6. Jupiter masses... 6.5 Jupiter mass is still fairly safely in planetary range. It's when you get above, and there are some in the extrasolar planet encyclopedia that uh, push that limit of low mass brown dwarf, too. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to see another fight, though. I want people to just get along. So. I know. Why can't we just get along? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, so uh, however they handle it, as long as they're, you know, I think I'm Canadian, so, you know, sorry. Um, okay, uh, so let's move on. Uh, speaking of, uh, no, I got no segue for this. Elizabeth, uh, there's an asteroid that's not going to kill us, but people are already Yay. starting to freak out that it might. Yes. Okay. So there, you might have seen some news reports about a newly discovered asteroid. It was found on October 8th, um, and they were going to say that it might hit us in 2032. Now, don't worry. Uh, NASA's on it as usual, and uh, they took a look at it, and they said that based on their first week of calculating the asteroids trajectory, it appears that it's going to have a 1 in 63,000 chance of hitting the Earth. And to put that in perspective, that's about 99.998%. So it's far, far less than 1%. And uh, another thing to bear in mind, too, is that whenever we see these new objects, we don't have their complete orbit yet. It takes a bit of time to take a look at it. And uh, I actually was looking at a blog post from a guy who... Um, his name is po Peter Lake, and uh, he put a nice uh, picture, a few pictures of uh, the asteroid online as he was tracking it. And so he keeps track of these things quite a bit. And he said the thing is, um, often these stay on the Torino scale, the risk register, for a very short time um, after they come on there because we just don't know the trajectory further. Um, all the way yet. So uh, what they do is they take a look, they give you the first numbers, and then they look again and they get some more numbers. And so that's what NASA is doing right now. They had a blog post NASA just today or yesterday saying that uh, the current probability is 99.998%, but then they said it's a relatively new discovery with more observations. They expect it will be able to significantly reduce or rule out entirely any impact probability for the foreseeable future. So uh, the big message here is don't panic. Just wait. Everything seems to be okay. Take a deep breath. 
worry about the shutdown. <laughs> That's probably the worst effect so, on astronomy for the so, time so being. So to, to quote Dumb and Dumber, that you say there's a chance. <laughs> a very, 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 very tiny chance. You have the worst chance of getting hit by a car and killed. You know. But, so. but uh, the thing about this is that it's not as if somebody is flipping a coin 65,000 times and by golly, one of those times it's going to come up. It's more a reflection of how little is known about the orbital path of this object. And so uh, when, you, when you talk about uh, risk assessment, it, it's easy to kind of get confused and you, you kind of feel like you're playing the lottery, but it's not really like that. It's more a reflection of our, our ignorance and, and eventually they'll get the chance down to one or zero and it's almost, you know, uh, it's uh, certain to be zero. Uh, almost, we, went the, the same, almost. we went through the same thing with Tutatis about a decade ago yeah. for its 2029 20, flyby. Exactly. I mean, this is great. You know, the B612 Foundation is, has got this great <clears throat> idea for a mission, which is like, let's plant a tracker on an asteroid and then let's really figure out how well these things move and be able to track their 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 position because as you said it is it's zero or it's one it's either not going to cause us any harm or it's going to hit us and, and we should really reassure everybody know. here that there are a lot of programs that are out there that are tracking asteroids we've got private foundations public foundations uh, foundations overseas in Europe so uh, there are a lot of places that are actually taking a look at asteroids tracking them making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing which is hopefully not hitting us <laughs> and uh, yeah so essentially what, what we're saying is that NASA's on the case and uh, other astronomers are on the case and they're going to be giving us some updated numbers as soon as they get that more trajectory. Awesome. Um, so don't panic but uh, go ahead and search for it and people will come to Universe today and hopefully we can get the word out <laughs> anywhere else. Um, okay so we're going to move on to an upcoming lunar eclipse. Yes, there is a there is a penumbral lunar eclipse. Uh, actually, just in a few hours, about three hours from now, uh, when the moon reaches full. Of course, you need the moon full in order to have a lunar eclipse. Unfortunately, this isn't really a, a grand event because the moon is going to be passing through the outer part of the Earth's shadow. It's going to be visible from Europe and North uh, North Africa. Those longitudes are going to see the entire penumbral. We're going to see it here from the east coast of North America as the moon is rising tonight, and from Central Asia, they're going to see it as the moon is setting. So you may or may or not notice anything. What happens when it's a penumbral eclipse is passing through that outer, brighter cone of the Earth's shadow, and you may see a light shading on the moon. The moon may look like a, uh, like a cop off white kind of color. Uh, you may see on the southern limb of the moon during greatest eclipse, the moon's about 70% in the, into the penumbra, uh, and that's usually about the limit that you need to actually see any kind of noticeable shading when it goes in. I have taken photos before of the moon before penumbral, during penumbral, then after. And a matter of fact, the post I have on Universe Today, you can actually see this. You can see that slight, subtle shading on there if you do it photographically. You've got to keep the camera settings the same. And the moon should be fairly high above the horizon. Otherwise, you're going to get discoloration just from looking through that air mass low on the horizon. That's going to, you would need the moon fairly high up in the sky. I think Europe would be well placed to do that sort of thing. This is the third lunar eclipse this uh, year, uh, the last one. We didn't really have any great lunar eclipses this year. We've got a good total lunar eclipse on U.S. Tax Day next year uh, that everybody will see on April 15th. That's probably the best lunar that's eclipse be that's coming one. up soon. We haven't had a good total lunar since, I think it was 2011 or 10. We had one uh, in December. Uh, I'm still using all my photos from that because I stayed up all night taking photos of that one. Uh, so lunar eclipses are cool because you can see them from that one half of the Earth that's turned toward it. You don't have to be, uh, as opposed to solar eclipses, where to see totality, you have to be along that track of the moon's path that's about 50 to 60 miles wide, depending on the eclipse. Uh, for a lunar eclipse, I've seen I've seen probably a dozen uh, since the 70s since I've started watching them. Well, I actually think sort of my friendship with Alan Boyle went back to a oh. lunar eclipse in that uh, he had set up, he had convinced the folks at NBC to live stream a lunar eclipse. Right. Uh, like Which one was that? 2003, I think. It was a long time ago. And uh, and then I sort wow. of heavily marketed it and sort of fired a bunch of traffic to what he was doing. And he was updating me on, on their views, the different cameras that they were bringing them up. So Ah, uh, the good old days. The, the good old <laughs> days when there was not a lot of people who were... Space journalists. I was in Arizona. I was probably watching that one. If it was visible from North America, I was I was taking photos at that time for that one. 
I, I believe I remember that one. I, I love Lunar Eclipses. That is like my Christmas. Yeah. So the SLU space camera uh, it has kind of made a business out of this, and so they're not only streaming the penumbral lunar eclipse, they're also streaming comet observations and meteor showers and the whole thing. So it's, it's really... Uh, this this lunar eclipse, like you say, David, is is not a biggie, but it's kind of yeah, fun yeah. to keep it on your computer screen, even if even if you're not able to see it in person, which is likely what's I'll, going to happen in Seattle tonight. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be doing I'll be doing a I'll be doing a star party here from the Necronomicon while the eclipse is happening, so we'll there probably look for it. And since the moon is full and we're downtown, that's probably what we'll be looking at anyways. The moon, I don't think we'll see a, a lot else. So. It's always with, cool. uh, you you can kind of tell with the penumbral eclipse even that there's something weird about the moon. So so yeah. it is worth uh, keeping an eye on. That's for sure. Uh, okay. So and then speaking of eclipses, we are in eclipse season, and so there's going to be a solar eclipse coming up. They come in they come in pairs, right? Alan. Yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, November 3rd. Uh, this one is going to be a hybrid eclipse, and only 5% of uh, solar eclipses are hybrids, and that means that it starts out as a ring of fire eclipse and then becomes a total, and it may turn back into a ring of fire. This one will uh, end up as a total eclipse, and the best viewing is in Africa, and so people are already making their plans to, to get to Africa to see this one. Uh, Gabon, uh, Kenya, Uganda, those are the hot spots. And uh, since there are so many people who might be seeing this, and, and it's really a teachable moment for, uh, for school children in Africa. And, and so I just did a story last week about astronomers without borders and how they're trying to raise money and get uh, eclipse uh, safety glasses to uh, kids in Africa. It's really a worthwhile cause. If you do a search on Astronomers Without Borders, uh, you'll probably come across that web page and, and you'll probably learn a little bit about hybrid eclipses in the process. That's great. Uh, so I always like to do this poll. So who has, who here has seen a total solar eclipse with their own eyeballs? Believe it or not, no. <laughs> Alan, you have. I've seen it. You bet. Yeah. Last year, I've seen an annual. Almost at the same. <laughs> John, you have too. A total, a total solar eclipse. Yeah, not since the '90s, but it, it, I have. I got lucky enough, but Where I live in a it? pretty cloudy part of the world. Um, in Portland, it was in I think '98. Hmm. Or no, was that '98? It was sometime. It was sometime in the mid '90s. I'm pretty sure. And Alan, you, where did you go for it? I went to Australia. That was a year ago. Fantastic trip. Oh. So, and, and then I did see one. Actually, the one that I saw in the Pacific Northwest was in the '70s, 1970s. So. Yeah, we haven't had one in North America since '79. I think. '79 was the one that I went to yeah. the Stonehenge Monument at Golden Dale. So yeah. very, very right. memorable. The Druids I, were I, out. But then the big I, one is going to be what? 2018. 17. 17. August. Yeah. Mm -hmm. August. August 21st, 2017. So, so it's summer. So I'm hoping to go to that one because I haven't seen any at all. So Jackson Hole. Let's go to Jackson Hole and have <laughs> a big uh, party there. Is what that, do you say? Is that, what, is that what you're thinking? I was thinking uh, somewhere in the desert. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. All right. I was going to point out too this 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 hybrid eclipse coming out. Uh, it will be a partial rising solar eclipse for a lot of the U.S. East Coast. So uh, if, if you've got the proper eclipse glasses or filters, you will be able to see a portion of this eclipse. You won't see totality. Unfortunately, totality starts just off the Florida coast, about a few hundred miles off, is where the the path starts. But I will be able to. I'll be watching for it, assuming it gets clear that morning. Will I be able to? So so you on the east coast, you'll be able to see it. East, U.S. East Coast, U.S. East oh. Coast, and I think part of the Canadian Maritime will see a partial. Right. Okay. We'll see it online, Fraser. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Someone will be streaming it. Um, okay. So Elizabeth, now you had a story that we hadn't even—I I don't know where it even come from—but uh, <laughs> about this uh, this interesting research about clouds on Mars. Can you give us some information on this? Yeah, no problem at all. I think this is probably my favorite use of repurposing that I've heard of in a while. So uh, essentially, there's this big cloud chamber in Europe, and it's called, I'm just getting the name here, the Aerosol Interaction and Dynamics in the Atmosphere uh, Facility. And what they do usually is they try and simulate stuff that's happening on Earth over there. But in this case, they thought that they would try and make it a little bit more Mars-like. And so they did a few things inside of there. 
Uh, they removed all the oxygen from the chamber. They replaced it with nitrogen and carbon dioxide, which are, of course, the components that make up uh, Mars's atmosphere. And then because Mars has a lot of dust in it, in its atmosphere, they added some particles. And the idea was that um, because they would have these particles, it would be a little bit of a nucleus, I suppose, where water vapor could glom onto there and form some clouds. And then the next thing they did is they moved the temperature way low because it's very cold on Mars, of course. They had it at about minus uh, 81 degrees Fahrenheit, which is for Canadians like me, uh, minus 63 Celsius. And that's about the coldest temperature that clouds occur on Earth. Um, and then they were able to actually move it further down to about 84, minus 84 Celsius, minus 120 Fahrenheit, which is about like a balmy summer day on Mars. And so essentially they did all of this and they analyzed the stuff. And this is what they came up with. They discovered that on Mars, you need to have a lot more humidity to form a cloud than you do here on Earth. And this is important because it, that way we can make more accurate weather forecasts. And that's why it's important that we keep doing these types of experiments. And so they're actually hoping to go back and there's going to be a big refurbishment of the facility to make it even take colder temperatures. And that's exciting because now that we're talking about trying to get a better range of temperatures on Mars, we can see how clouds form in the winter, for example, as well as in the summer. So uh, I think this is just a beginning. If we can do a few more experiments like this, we could get some really great results and hopefully improve some weather forecasts there. Well, I mean, the weather on Mars uh, is very strange. I mean, you get these these planet-wide dust storms and the dust devils and a lot of really interesting interactions. And as you said, you know, normally Mars is extremely, extremely cold, but it can get kind of warm. And uh, so to, to get a better sense of, uh, of being able to detect the weather would be really, really helpful. Exactly, and it's not like we have a lot of weather stations up there. We do have several orbiters, of course, and a couple of uh, on-planet sites uh, where the um, where the rovers are. But in the past, we have had a few missions. There's one up in the polar area for a while, for example. And um, the thing is, we just need to have more data. It's um, I kind of compare it in my mind to trying to get accurate weather forecasts up in Canada's north because that's a similar situation. It's very isolated. It's expensive to get out there, and there just aren't a lot of data points. And so it's hard for people to get accurate weather forecasts, except on a very big scale. If you're standing in a particular part of Nunavut uh, or even on Devon Island in Canada, which is where the Mars Society has its uh, its base, it's just hard to get good weather forecasts because there aren't a lot of stations around there. So the more stations, the better. Um, in the meantime, though, the cheaper way is just to do some simulations here on Earth, and this is a good first step to getting that. Very cool. Uh, so one last uh, one last story before we have time is we're going to talk about uh, Comet Ison again, and uh, in this case, uh, that it it's still going strong. Comet Ison is still there. Yes, uh, the, the, there was some images that were released from Hubble earlier this week, and it shows that Comet Ison, contrary to what you've been hearing about a lot of rumors that have been going around a lot of the chat groups and stuff about it breaking apart or things following it or, you know, kind of hill bop revisited kind of stories. That Comet Ison is doing fine. And I, I got a chance to see it a few days ago with my telescope for the first time. I've been watching in the morning. Uh, it's right about 10th magnitude. It's still very faint visually. I'm starting to see some really good uh, images right now. Uh, Rob Sparks over in Tucson got a pretty good image of ice, and it's very near Mars and Regulus right now. Yeah, it looked nothing like that through the telescope. It, it was it was a very faint spot. But of course, my telescope isn't in Hubble either. Yeah, so, yeah. You uh, don't have the Hubble Space Telescope? Oh, okay. No, I don't, unfortunately. I, I have a much smaller, uh, same kind of configuration, Smith Cassegrain, but much smaller. And unfortunately, I have to look through the Earth's atmosphere and Florida's atmosphere at that. So it's uh, Comet Ison, it, it seems to be brightening up right about on schedule. There was It was a few magnitudes behind earlier a few weeks ago. But I think it's going to be, if it keeps on track, uh, it's going to be naked eye probably about a month from now, if you're at a dark sky site, probably about mid-November. And that's when things are really going to ramp up because we're going to be heading in toward perihelion. And right around that week of perihelion is where it's supposed to be brightest. That right around uh, U.S. Thanksgiving, the end of November, is going to be really an interesting week. And it, recently, there was a, at, at the last uh, DPS meeting last week, there was a report that came out, we talked about in the last space hangout, that ISIN, they're putting the survival limit of ice and past perihelion much higher than they had previously predicted. They had said 50-50, but the researchers there uh, seemed pretty confident that it was outside of that 200 meter size nucleus. Uh, the, the current estimates I've heard for ISIN's nucleus is anywhere from the low end of 0.5 kilometers, 500 meters, to up to two or three uh, kilometers. So even with all that sublimation going on, on it, it should survive. 
and it definitely so it definitely hasn't broken up. It's definitely not a no. collection of, of objects. It's not three objects. It's not a UFO. It is a regular no. comet that seems to be holding. In, in this, it, it's not a crude sun grazer per se, but it's it's a it is a sun grazing comet. It has a lot of the characteristics of that type of like Lovejoy was a few years ago. Lovejoy came much closer to the sun and it survived. Uh, and Lovejoy at this distance was much fainter than Ison is now, so that gives us a pretty good uh, that that puts a, a good check mark in the plus category for for having a pretty good show out of this comet. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, good. Well, we're just going to keep an eye on it. So again, perihelion is when November twenty eighth. I'm pretty sure it's it's right around. If it's not right on the twenty eighth, it's it's uh, it's within a few hours either side. So. So we are just uh, you know closing in on a month away from, from. And we've been. This comet was found September of last year. That that's what struck me when I saw it the telescope last last week. I was like, you know, how many articles have I written about this comet? And I just finally got to see it after a year. <laughs> that's great. Okay, cool. Well, I think we're going to wrap this up then. Uh, we, I'm amazed we made it through all of the stories that I had put on the docket. So that's great. Thanks to all of you for being uh, for being so knowledgeable and yet uh, focused. Uh, so for, I'm going to sort of give everyone a chance to uh, to find out where we can find out more. So Alan Boyle, where do we find out more? Uh, Twitter handle b zero y l e and website uh, is the easiest is cosmiclog.com that'll get to my stuff on NBC News perfect Brian where do we find out more <coughs> my website is nextbigfuture.com um, it's a three words.com and I also um, participate in the carnival of space which uh, moves around to different um, websites which um, I think next week is it uh, universe today yeah, I mean, participate is an understatement. You are the uh, the sort of the guy who organizes the whole thing, coordinates all of the bloggers, and pulls all the stories together. So, mm -hmm. if you want to participate in the Carnival of Space, which is this this collection of articles that moves from website to website, it's a great way if you want to sort of expand. If you're a blogger, or you take photographs, or you want to kind of interact with this space journalism community, by all means, contact Brian. Get involved in the Carnival of Space. It's fantastic. And definitely check out Next Big Future. I'm a, I really enjoy his, his site. Uh, David, where do we find out more? I am at Astroguys with a Z. I am on my own website, astroguys.com, writing for Universe Day, Listosaur, Canada.com. I'm currently a frequent contributor there, too. And I will be doing Star Party duty if you're at the 2013 Necronomicon tonight. Uh, come on out and look at the penumbrally eclipsed full moon. Where, where is the Necronomicon? It is in. It's at the Embassy Suites Plaza here in Tampa. They just moved. This is the first year they're at the USF campus. It used to be down in St. Pete. This is the third year I've done Star Party duty here since I found out about it. It's just an overall sci-fi horror fantasy convention. But we do. Uh, they have a science track here, so I'll be on a couple planet uh, panels on exoplanets tomorrow as well. So, Elizabeth, where do we find out more? Go to my uh, Twitter handle, which is HowlSpace, H-O-W-E-L-L -L Space, and uh, I'm daily on Universe Today, uh, almost daily on Space.com, and then I'm scattered around a bunch of other sites. I just had a story published in Canadian Geographic this week, for example, so oh, cool. check it out. Fantastic. That's great. Okay, and John, one last time for people who uh, maybe missed the part, where can we find out more about uh, both Space Advocates and Penny for NASA? To find out more about Space Advocates, go to spaceadvocates.com. You can find links to all of the campaigns that we support. Currently, it's just Penny for NASA. You can find Penny for NASA at Penny, the number four, nasa.org, and that has links to all of our social media, which I encourage everyone to go and follow. We post news at least three times a day. Yeah, and you do some really great stuff over on Google+. Plus. A lot of the, the sort of social stuff that you've been doing has just been fantastic. So, so if you do get NASA to double their budget, would you let us know? Absolutely. Great. <laughs> we appreciate that. So once again, I'm the publisher of Universe Today. You can find out more stories from, from us over at universetoday.com. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the YouTube channel. <laughs> where the subscribe button is. Uh, we're posting, we do the virtual star parties on Sunday nights. We do the weekly space hangout on, uh, on Fridays. We do astronomy cast with Dr. Pamela Gay on Mondays. And I release two explainer videos every week on, on YouTube. So you'll want to subscribe and, and catch all that. So thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks to the panel for joining me this week. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Later. Bye.